in our processional hymn.
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And we respond with the Kyrie, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And with, and with your spirit. spirit. And let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. And as our children prepare for their Zoom Children's Church, let's say a prayer of our children as Miss Myra leads them this morning. Gracious Father, we just continue to ask, Lord, that you would strengthen and deepen the faith of our children as they walk through this very peculiar time in our history. Lord, may you teach them to endure in suffering, to trust in you in all circumstances. And that, Father, we pray that they would trust Jesus and fear not the future because he is with them. Lord, we ask you to bless Miss Myra as she brings forth the lesson this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. First reading this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, 
then I will lengthen your days. The word of the Lord. verses 121 to 136. I invite you to stand with me. I will read to the asterisk and invite you, the congregation, to respond with the remainder of the verse. I have done that which is lawful and right. Oh, give, give me not over to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant's good. Oh, let, let not the arrogant, arrogant oppress me. My eyes have wasted away with looking for your salvation. And for, and for the, the word, word of your, your righteousness. O oh, deal with your servant according to your loving mercy. And, and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. O oh, grant me understanding. That, that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you, O oh Lord, to act. For they, for they have, have broken, broken your law. law. For I love your commandments above all things. More, More than, than gold, gold and precious stones. Therefore I hold all your commandments to be right. And all, and all false ways I utterly, utterly abhor. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore does, my does soul your soul keep them. them. When your word goes forth, it gives light. And, and understanding, understanding to, to the, the simple. simple. I opened my mouth and drew in my breath. For, For my delight was in your commandments. O oh, look upon me and be merciful unto me. As, as you, you always do for those who love your name. Order my steps according to your word. And, and so shall no wickedness have dominion over me. O oh, deliver me from those who deal wrongly. And so, and so shall, shall I keep your, your commandments. Show the light of your countenance upon your servant. And, and teach me your statutes. My eyes gush out water. Because, because of those who do not, not keep your law. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and will, will be forever. forever. Amen. You may be seated for the second lesson. The second lesson comes from Romans 8, starting at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is, what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand and join us in our gradual song as we prepare our hearts for the gospel.
Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. Reading from the 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, beginning at verse 31. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then his joy, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it is full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of this age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. So that place will be, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts and minds of your people and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's great to have all of you with us, either uh, in person or also online. So it's good to see all of you this morning. Today we complete our three-week series on the parables of Matthew chapter 13. And uh, you, you probably are a little afraid at this point because you know that I took a while to preach the first one on the parable of the soils. And then I was a little better on the soil of the weeds. But now we've got five parables to go over. <laughs> and you're, you're probably shaking a little bit. I, I promise you we will not spend as long a time on each of these parables as we did the others. Let me just remind you again of what a parable is. A parable is a story about one thing that helps un you understand something else. Um, they're throughout the scriptures, but Jesus particularly liked to use parables. They're a word picture. They're something that helps you understand. Jesus also tells us that he talked in parables because, in a sense, he was waiting to see who would respond to the parable and seek to greater understanding. And remember that he says that in that parable of the soils. He who understands the word of the kingdom. And so Jesus is always looking for people who are willing to dig in, to, to, to find out about the mystery of the kingdom and to have it understood. If you're a Christian, 
this understanding of what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is should be something that you're preoccupied with. It should be something that you, you spend a good bit of time uh, exploring because Jesus talks so much about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. It's not about heaven. It's not about going to heaven. It's not about a physical kingdom. It's about God reigning in the hearts and minds of men and women. And as the kingdom grows, it's about the coming of the kingdom reigning in the hearts of men and women as God's kingdom grows more and more, we see the advancement of the kingdom. Um, many of us are coming off a week of Camp Araminta, our, our diocesan summer camp. Uh, this was our 14th year, 14, one in four. Um, and uh, this year we did a virtual camp, uh, which I, I'm, I, I could never preach after camp. So this is amazing. You know, I guess we had like, we were two hours a night for five nights and not near as exhausting, but um, really... Lots of consternation, lots of concern whether or not we could effectively do a summer camp virtually. Here are kids that have spent months on Zoom calls for class, and, and now here they are being asked to go to camp on, online. But um, God's kingdom is always advancing, and God is not limited even by physical distance. And I am here to report that uh, we saw fruit of the kingdom of God. We saw God beginning to reign in the hearts of young men and women who were on the call, some of whom probably had, would never have come to physical camp. It was too intimidating or too far a drive or whatever, but they, they were willing to get online, and we heard testimonies on Friday night of the kingdom coming in the hearts and minds. Young men and women allowing Jesus to reign in their lives, beginning to correct their behaviors and call them into obedience and love for him and worship. So I'm, my heart is full, although I'm still tired. It's funny, I, I didn't work near as hard this year, but still a sense of tiredness, three hours a, a night for, for uh, five nights, but, but yet we saw the kingdom coming. So that's what a parable is, that's what the kingdom is, and that's what the Lord wants to, what the Lord is teaching us through these parables, these seven parables in Matthew chapter 13. You could say that many parables, and this is not a hard, parables are many things, but you could say that parables are like riddles. So a one way to put a lot of these short parables that Jesus gives, these staccato parables that we get here, that leaven and, and, and mustard seed and, and a pearl of great price and a treasure, these are almost like riddles. And so you could almost ask them, turn around and say, how is the kingdom of God like a precious pearl? How is the kingdom of God like a buried treasure? How is the kingdom of God like a mustard seed? How is the kingdom of God like leaven? And then Jesus quickly gives an answer or an indication of those three things. Now what you might not notice is that the, these parables are actually broken into three groups. There's two, the two, and then the one. And the first two are actually given to the crowds. We are not told that the crowds are present for the second two, nor for the third. Those come after a break in the passage, which you didn't have in the reading today, that indicates that Jesus withdrew and he said nothing more to the crowds, we're told in, in, John, in, in Matthew 13. He only was speaking to the disciples. So the first two are really given to the crowds. And there are these two matching uh, seeds and mustard seed and, and leaven. They're really interesting. In both cases, you're talking about something really small that doesn't seem like it has any ultimate benefit, and yet it has a, a, a great outcome. Um, what is unseen, Jesus says, is important with regard to the kingdom of God. Jesus is coming to the end of uh, Matthew 13. He is, he is being, he's going to be rejected by his own people. He goes to Nazareth. He's rejected from them. And it's a foreshadowing of the rejection that Jesus will suffer in Jerusalem at the hands of the religious leaders, ultimately to be crucified. This is the midway point in Matthew's gospel. I said that in week one, but just to remind you, this is the, the breaking point. He's rejected in, in Galilee. He's rejected in Nazareth. And now he turns his face towards Jerusalem and sets forth to go to Jerusalem uh, to, to become the savior of the world. So there's a sense in which um, the kingdom doesn't look like a whole lot as Jesus comes to the end of Matthew chapter 13. It seems pretty insignificant, small, like a tiny little mustard seed. 
You see, for a long time I thought, well, mustard seed is like the faith that grows within us over time. I don't think it's about an individual believer. I think it's about the, the manifestation of the kingdom. The kingdom is all the people for whom God begins to reign in their lives. And so at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the kingdom looked pretty minuscule, pretty insignificant, easy to be wiped out, a tiny mustard seed. Probably not, actually, biologists tell us, not the smallest seed, but that's not the point. The, the point is that it's a, it's a tiny little seed that becomes this giant bush that, that birds are able to perch in and make their, make their nest in. And, and that's what Jesus wants to say. He's, he's saying, don't judge what you can see about the kingdom. Understand that the kingdom is growing. It's going someplace. And, and what is necessary for the kingdom to reign and rule all over the world is, is found in the genesis of it, in this seed and what Jesus plants. Of course, we know ultimately Jesus is talking about the, the Gentile world that will come to worship Christ. Two billion Christians in the world today, almost a third of the world's population. The, the Gentiles, the nations of the earth literally coming to worship God through Jesus Christ. The other parallel is the leaven. Which is interesting because leaven is normally used to, in a negative sense when you're talking about it. Leaven is, you know, the, the sort of the pharisaical understanding is that leaven is bad. It's like sin, which is why, you know, unleavened bread. We use unleavened bread at communion. And we, we, we talk about unleavened bread at the, at the exodus, at the coming out of Egypt. And yet Jesus takes the, that negatively connotation, negative connotation of leaven and he turns it around and he makes it positive. What's he saying there? The, the kingdom may even be disparaged. It may even be seen as a bad thing. I mean, uh, there are times in history, obviously, where Christians have been blamed for things and, and became the scapegoat for, for different things throughout history. And, and even in our day now, there's a sense in which there are people who, you know, we're responsible for the COVID-19 virus, right? We're the hotspots. We're the, we're the problem. New York Times talking about, you know, bad churches who are getting together and spreading the virus and things like that. And and, and so oftentimes the kingdom can be seen in a negative connotation. And Jesus says, no, it, it, but the, the, the kingdom, like the mustard seed, is this leaven that enters into the bread and, and eventually it affects the entire loaves. Now, the amount of flour that Jesus is describing here, these three parts, would have made enough bread for about 100 people. So Jesus is this, you know, just like with the mustard seed and the birds that come to perch, which is the, the Gentile nations, here this, there's enough bread to feed 100 people. There's a feast going on here. There's a kingdom feast. There's rejoicing and, the, and the, the fruit of the kingdom. It's unseen now, but don't judge it by what, it, what you can see now. Understand that the kingdom starts small and continually grows. I think that's an encouraging word for us this morning. So those are two parables that are given to the, to the unbelievers, to the crowds, so to speak, the would-be Christians. See how quickly we got through those first two? So the second two are sort of like that. The second two parables come in, they're, they're sort of a pair. And in both parables, you have, there's a cer certain hiddenness to both of them. The, the treasure that's buried and the pearl, they're both hidden. They have to be discovered and found. They're of great wealth, but there's a costliness to obtaining them. They're hidden. There's, they're of great wealth, but there's a costliness to them. In both cases, both the man who discovers the hidden treasure, he sells all he has and buys the land so he can have the treasure. In the other parable, he, he sells all he has to obtain this pearl, this precious pearl that, that is of, of infinite value. And in so both cases, Jesus is reminding us that, the, that the, the kingdom of God is in that same way, a riddle. How is the kingdom of God like a, treasure, a precious treasure, buried treasure or a pearl of great worth? It, it is worth everything, but it will also cost you everything. It's a commitment of our whole selves. I mean, and this parallels Jesus' words, Right? Anyone who gains his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the kingdom will gain. It's this costliness, this willingness to, to lay it all down, to, to turn and, and to submit and say, Jesus, you reign in my life. You be Lord. 
I, I, will, I will follow you. You know, for me at 15, it meant rather than chasing after popularity to, to, to allow the Lord to direct me to the people who needed a friend, who didn't have a friend, who wouldn't help me socially, but I could be a friend to them and help them eternally. It's, it's a, it's a it's, it, Tim Keller says it's, it's the upside down kingdom. It's, it's the inside out kingdom. It's the, it's the complete reversal of everything the world screams at us as to how we should live. But it's, it's this precious treasure, this pearl of great price that God offers to us if we're willing to seek after it with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, it's interesting. The two are parallel, and yet they're different. In one case, the, the, the man stumbles over the buried treasure, right? He, stumb, he, he just completely finds it by accident. Do you know people that, that found the kingdom of God and found Jesus Christ by accident? They, they weren't looking for him, right? And, and they just, they, all of a sudden, here, here, was, here was this presentation or this opportunity to hear the gospel, and they weren't looking for it. I, I think of like kids that go to Young Life camps. Our, our son-in-law, Andy, is a Young Life uh, leader, and there's some kids that, that go to Young Life camp for everything in the world except Jesus, and yet they, they find this, they stumble upon this buried treasure of the gospel. I think Dave Hall experienced that years ago going to a, a, a Young Life camp. At, but then look at the other side of it, the pearl of great price. It's not somebody who stumbles upon it. It's somebody who intentionally is a professional in seeking it. You know, somebody like C.S. Lewis, who, who actually studied Christianity and, and then despite all of his research and all of his att- attempts to, to, to avoid it, came to the conclusion that, in fact, Jesus Christ was the Son of God and he he falls on his knees, right, in, in boarding school and says he was the most reluctant disciple of Jesus ever. Lewis didn't stumble upon the faith. He studied diligently as a professional academic and yet came to find Christ, the pearl of great price. You see, in both cases, costly, yes, hidden, yes, uh, uh, regarding, you know, of great, great wealth. One stumbles upon it and another one studies diligently to find it. And we see both types of, of people who bow their knee to the reigning lordship of Jesus Christ. So in that case, what's required? What's unseen? Secondly, what's required? The second two pearls. And then the last parable, what's at stake? Now, you probably, when you heard the, the parable of the dragnet or the net, you, you, had this, um, you had this remembrance that, you know, if you were around or you have read before the parable of the weeds that we talked about last week. It's a, it's a parable of judgment that, that some are wheat and some are uh, these tares or they're, or they're this weed called darnel, which is a strange word. But, but they grow together and then what, what we're told is that at the harvest time, the weeds are separated out from the wheat. And that won't happen until the final judgment. Jesus, almost verbatim, draws the disciples' attention through this parable of the net to the fact that there will come a day, just as the creed says, when God will judge the living and the dead. And, and those who've, who are righteous will, will be here, and those who are evil will be here. And, and that same kind of language that he used with that parable of the weeds is here again as well. They're very similar. Remember in the first week of these series of parables, I reminded you that, that, that ultimately Jesus is always drawing us to a decision. What will we do with him? Will we reject him or will we receive him? He, he makes the opportunity for us to respond to him. And every human being gets to make the decision about what they'll do with Jesus. They're all presented with the opportunity. And, and, and yet here, here is Jesus reminding us that ultimately, at the end of the day, that choice will re- result in, in either rejection from God and re- or, or acceptance by God. You see, at the beginning, it's about will you, will you be receptive to the kingdom of God? In the end, it will be are you receptive by the kingdom of God, depending on what we do. And we talked about all the things that are involved there, so... It's here that it's helpful for me to remember 
that parables, like I said, are throughout the whole scripture. And I'm reminded of the parable of, of David that, that Nathan, the prophet, tells to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Maybe you're familiar with it or not. Um, most people, even though they don't know their Bibles, very, if they don't know their Bibles very well, know the story of David and Bathsheba. And, and David's public sin of not only uh, having an affair with Bathsheba, but then having Bathsheba's husband killed, Uriah, killed in battle um, to cover up his sin. Uh, Nathan the prophet, remind you, comes to David and tells him a parable, a story about something that's meant to point to something else. And he, he tells David this story about this, this man who has one little sheep and he sleeps with it, and he cares for it, and he eats from his fingers, and, and he loves this little sheep with all of his might. And then there's a rich man, Nathan says to David, who had a hundred sheep. But it comes time to have dinner, and rather than taking from his hundred sheep to have dinner, he chooses to take this, this poor man's one lone sheep. And he kills it and eats it. And David is furious, right? He is furious. This man should be killed for what he's done, right? Yeah, he's the king, you know. He should be killed for his, and he should have to pay that guy back. He should have to give him four sheep for the one he took. And, and David's just kind of going off. And Nathan turns to him. Remember what, David said, what Nathan says? You are the man. And in that moment, David is confronted with his sin. And David confesses, I have sinned against God. He, I, 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 in other words, I am not a righteous man. And, and I, 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 like that man in your parable, Nathan, deserve death. But God is merciful. There's consequences. The child that was conceived by Bathsheba does not live. And David has to grieve that. And David has to deal with consequences that will far, be far-reaching in his life. When we sin, there are consequences. But before God, he is forgiven and made righteous. And David writes Psalm 32 right after this this incident with, with Nathan. And God forgives David and David proclaims God's forgiveness in Psalm 32. Now, why do I share this whole parable with you? Well, I, I share it with you because I want you to be reminded that there is none who is righteous. You see, we, we begin to go, well, who, who's, who's the good fish and who's the bad fish? Who, who's the wheat and who's the, who's the tare? Who's the, the weed? And yet, we are all unrighteous unless we're made righteous in God. But here's what David says in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Your strength was dried up by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Friends, Jesus tells this final parable of the kingdom it's a parable about judgment and separating the righteous and the evil. But remember that it's Jesus, the righteous one, who is able to make us righteous. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who knew no sin to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. How do we find the kingdom of God? We, we look to Jesus. Remember, the kingdom always looks like Jesus. It's costly, but it's of great value. It's worth everything. Don't judge it from where it looks at a particular moment. Understand that within the seed of the kingdom is the ultimate victory, the place where there'll be a great banquet and where there'll be um, all the nations, all the cultures, all the races, all the, all the people of the world coming together to worship Jesus the Lamb who was slain and is alive. Look what you see. We, we can be the righteousness of the kingdom. If
if we cling to the righteous King Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. response to the great gospel, let us stand together and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Amen. I invite you to kneel with me for the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Neil, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service. Lord, we hold up to you the elections on August 18th. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all of those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity.
Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with depression and anxiety and those that are looking for work. I pray for Eric. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all of those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Increase, O God, the spirit of neighborliness among us, that in peril we may uphold one another, in suffering tend to one another, and in homelessness, loneliness, or exile befriend one another. Grant us brave and enduring hearts that we may strengthen one another until the disciplines and testing of these days are ended, and you again give peace in our time. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of our Lord be always with you. I invite you to stand in your place and wave to those around you in the peace of Christ. <laughs> and you may be seated. Well, it's great to see all of you here live in person and then also those you're watching us online. We're grateful that you're with us as well. Um, we continue to make steps in preparation for phase two. Um, we are, uh, the emergency team has met and we're beginning to work out how we would uh, begin to offer communion of, of the bread kind to begin to uh, allow our children to meet as they're about to return to school and, uh, and also maybe get a second singer on Sunday mornings, although Beth did a great job this morning. Um, Jose is filling in for David, who's on vacation this week, and uh, so we give thanks for Jose and his music ministry. Continue to RSVP for the services, if you would. That's really, really helpful, and we, we trust that as, as some of you who are watching online begin to, to come back to church in time, that uh, that will allow us to plan for, for enough space. We have plenty of room at this point, so feel free to join us. We'll continue with our book study on How to Think by Alan Jacobs this Wednesday night at 7 p.m., looking at chapters 6 and 7 this week, but also time to review things. This is helping us learn how to have conversation about things that are divisive in our culture. If there's any place that the church, the church should be the place where we can talk about hard things in a civil manner. Uh, community days are continuing. This will be the last one for now uh, for, that Farm Share is partnering with us. I can report that we have by the calculations of our, our leadership, 100,000 people have been served food through the last uh, 14 weeks of the COVID 
uh, virus. There are still lots of people who are food insecure in our, in our communities, and so we're grateful to be a part of that. So this will be the last one as, as we know, and then we'll have to renegotiate. But I do want to tell you about that 100,000 mark, which is quite a thing. Um, and just to, just to encourage you that the Lord is still at work. I mean, uh, we, we really did not know what to expect for the online Araminta camp. Araminta nights, as we called it. Jamie's actually wearing the t-shirt. Uh, but the kids responded. We had 84 kids sign up. And not all of them were on every night, but we did see fruit in an amazing way, in a very encouraging way, as our young adults stepped up and, uh, and really showed leadership. So just give, we give thanks for that and uh, all that's done. I'm looking to Beth because Beth and Jamie are both a part of the core team uh, that puts on Camp Araminta. So now we come to the time of, of spiritual communion. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. One, one more thing. We are, as an option, starting next week, we're going to offer a bread communion after the service outside. So if you'd like to, to receive next week, we will have that worked out. And then over the next couple of weeks, we'll figure out how to do it actually in the building. So I do want to let you know that. invite you to stand with me. The Lord be with you. And with and your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give him thanks and praise. It is right. Our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with, our, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your great mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore, let let us keep keep the feast. feast. Alleluia. Let's say together the prayer of spiritual communion. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things. And I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you together with all your faithful people, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
All of our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All of our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all of our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. Alleluia. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Larry, good to see you, man. Yeah, yeah. Doing all right? Yeah. We'll bring you guys to Gainesville. Wonderful, we'd love to have you. For glad.